Good afternoon, Lord Parker. Good afternoon, uh, General Soko. So today is Monday the 15th of January 2024. Thank you for taking some time to do another Q&A. Today I wanted to ask you about a question that arose as I was talking with a friend recently. He was mentioning how in meditation, or maybe meditation reveals it, he realizes that he's experiencing a lot of worry and anxiety and fear. And it's not fear experienced as personal fear, like he's in danger of harm personally at the moment, but maybe just more in a general sense. And he feels it very physically, but he's speaking more of a general sense of fear that there's war in the Middle East, that there's climate change, uh, afraid of being bullied by other people in school. And this fear arises particularly in the evenings when he's trying to go to sleep. But more recently, he's even sort of wondered if when he's meditating, it's not letting his mind run wild and kind of feeds the fear and the worry. Could you say something towards that, please? Well, in the world, that we experience through the body and the senses, there's a lot of fear. And now we're exposed to so much information to worry about. And, uh, you know, the mass media, the internet. So, uh, in news is usually about what's wrong or war or scandals. So what are you going to do about it? You know, in meditation, believing meditation is trying to get rid of it. Uh, fear or worry or anxiety. Then you're kind of creating more problems with just, with just the attempt to resist it or get rid of it. But to recognize that the awareness itself is not frightened. You're aware of fear or anxiety or worry. And that which is aware of those states of mind is not worried or anxious or frightened. So you begin to take your stand with awareness, which is clarity and seeing things as they are, rather than trying to uh, get rid of these kind of emotions. And just to notice how much of life, there's a lot of, to be frightened of in life. You know, when your very vulnerable bodies easily damaged, we can be insulted or bullied or treated unfairly, that that's possible for any of us. And then, then uh, there's old age and sickness and death in the, you know, that is what we're all going to experience. So when we, we think about that, you know, uh, what happens when you die or what will happen in the Middle East or what's going to happen with the climate change then you don't know. None of us know. And so that not knowing, recognize that, that the future is unknown. None of us can predict or know the future in the present, because the present is where we experience here and now. So it's learning like proper meditation is establishing oneself in the present moment. It's like this. Fear or anxiety, worry is like this. And, and just by relating to it in an objective way, 
rather than seeing it in personal terms, like there's something wrong with you, or uh, is it neurosis, or is it, you know, we can blame ourselves or blame the world, blame the society, blame the schoolmates, or whatever, but, uh, you know, so we tend to blame our suffering on external sources where the Buddha encouraged us to use suffering, recognize, understand suffering uh, that, that we, yeah, we, we relate to as, as an object of observation rather than as some kind of personal problem. Because what can any of us do about the Middle East or the Ukraine or climate change, you know, we can be more careful or, or forgiving or we can operate from ideas, ideals, but the direct path is to recognize that what you're feeling in the present is impermanent, it, it arises and ceases, because one is certainly not anxious all the time or or frightened all the time, or worried all the time. But none of us want to worry, or feel anxiety, or fear. But this realm where you're, you're incarnated in a human form is a very delicate form, it's very sensitive. And so, the, you know, it just that, realistically speaking, that's possibility of being damaged at any moment, uh, from birth to, to death. And uh, in wisdom, we recognize that and not take it personally, not make it into some kind of personal problem that I'm an anxious person, I, I should be brave, I should, uh, you know, try to get rid of this habit of worrying about the future because all these attempts from the ego to stop it or resist it just increase the, 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 the fear and anxiety and worry. So that's why mindfulness, awareness here and now, like in meditation, be, rather than trying to get rid of wandering thoughts and, and worries and anxieties, use them for just observing there the way they are. And you're letting, when you do this, then you're letting go of them rather than getting caught up and increasing them or trying to resist them and, and suppress them. But you're actually using the experience in the present moment with wisdom, which seeing that, that, that the Anxious anxiety in the moment is impermanent, and it's not personal. With worry, anxiety, and fear, very often it has a tendency to become obsessive, kind of a bit of a runaway train. How do you deal with that? Well, just like I have been saying, just learn to change your attitude towards it, because. <clears throat> You know, if one, uh, one is, a, is an obsessive worrier and one tries to, to uh, then you start worrying about worrying. It's a vicious cycle that you can't ever win, but you can wisely observe. I understand the point you're making, but sometimes when people describe kind of these situations, even though changing the attitude is a correct, a good advice, sometimes they feel like they need something more tangible to latch onto than just change your attitude. In terms of just sort of meditate, more meditation techniques that they can just get a handle on that will take them to changing their attitudes. Do you have any advice on that? No. <laughs> Well, one can change the subject of thinking. Of thinking. 
such as Well, like um, metta, practice loving kindness towards worry and anxiety, which means that accepting it is it and change, which is a way of letting go of it actually, because the, the the whole emphasis on letting go of it, because like any form of resistance or attachment, is is the cause of the suffering because it, there is a lot to worry about and uh, in the in the world and so uh, you you can't ever not worry about things in terms of just uh, not shutting the world out but to be the knower of the world, what they call the loka we do, the knower of the world, is one of the names of the Buddha. So the world is this way, and right now, modern life in England is like this. And your, your relationship with your family is like this. Your relationship to, to the office uh, your business or partners are like this, and it's it's not critical. It's not you're not trying to blame anybody for it, but recognize that when you meet this person, this is what you feel, and you might have the idea of loving kindness towards all sentient beings as an ideal, but. And the wisdom approach is to be the witness to uh, the anxiety you feel when, when certain people come into view or the future, the future is, is, is unknown. You, don't, you, you know, you can't, you can kind of go to fortune tellers or astrologers and people that can say they can see into the future. But in terms of actual re- of reality in the present moment, the future is imagined, it's, it's thought. You have to think about tomorrow in the present moment. And tomorrow right now is an image in my, in my consciousness. And it, it's practical, there's nothing wrong with it, but you know, right now, tomorrow, is, is, doesn't exist, but it's imagined or anticipated. You mentioned thinking. Is, you know, thinking seems to play a big role in giving rise to and then feeding worry, anxiety, and fear. How do you, how do you recognize this fear that is just normal fear from living in a biological world like that story of a cobra that was in the toilet at your kuti when you were in Ratnanachat and just survival instinct and then the type of worry and fear that's just generated through a lot of thinking is there a difference and if yes how do you how do you recognize the difference well when there's a mean imminent danger, the survival mechanism operates. Like the cobra in the toilet, in the bathroom. Uh, I never worried about that, uh, you know, before. It just it never occurred to me that I'd find a, a angry cobra in my bathroom. And then when I recognized it, I didn't think, I wasn't frightened, I recognized an immediate danger and managed to get away by leaping over a cobra which was coming toward me. And, and after I got out of the bathroom, I began to shake with fear. <laughs> I know that this was quite an insight. 
they're in the immediacy of, of imminent danger, present danger. Uh, in such a situation as that, you had no time to think. You know, the danger was so here and now that you, you had to operate from spontaneity, from, from uh, which surprised me because I've never leaped over an angry cobra in my life or never anticipated such an event. But it's, uh, when, it, when, you know, I've heard stories of people drowning, you know, almost drowning, and they manage to get themselves on in on shore before they actually drown and then they start shaking with fear but when they're actually in the process of survival they're not frightened they they're just the 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 natural inheritance of survival takes over it's part of the human experience when you're born as a human being male or female you've got this this uh survival instinct. It's not something you acquire. It's natural to the species. Well, but, but if you think about it, like when monks want to go to Thailand, you know, then they hear stories about snakes and mosquitoes and dangerous things you might, you know, when you're here in England, Snakes aren't really a big problem. It's not something you grow up with worried about. And, and malaria is not a problem here. So, so uh, but you can be sitting in a kuti here at Amarbati and worrying about when you go to Thailand about malaria and, and dangerous creatures. What if a, a lion attacks? Or you know you can you can speculate. You can ask people what you should do if a lion attacks you or a tiger or something. But that's and but when that actually is happening, you have to depend on instinctual survival mechanisms, and they're natural. They're not created. You you can't you can't just Say, I'm going to, you know, you can say, I'm going to be brave and face the music, but that's just, that's just the ego speaking. Like thinking is, is a, a suffering because it's very divisive. You know, you can imagine anything, like all these conspiracy theories that are presently popular amongst people. Because, uh, you know, you can imagine deep states or secret societies or, or groups that want to annihilate you or, uh, you know, you can imagine all oh, that. There's something to, to uh, whatever you tend to incline to, you can create images of that. That's thinking. You're thinking about that affects you emotionally. You know, what you think is, you know, you think of the problems in, in the Middle East and you want to solve them. And then you, you know, that's, that's thinking, that's thinking about the Middle East. It's not wrong, you know, to, uh, to have a be concerned about what's happening in Ukraine and Russia and the Middle East, but but it's recognizing that it's what they call conceptual proliferation, thinking about so if we can do something about it. If I was invited to the Middle East to solve the problem between Israel and the Palestinians, you know, I would, and I thought I'd be a good influence, I'd go. But 
I've never been invited, and and I don't know how I could influence them. They're totally mindful of the of what's going on. And like they have a lot to worry about because they're in imminent danger, present danger. So it's really a lot about recognizing how thinking is involved. Yes. Thinking, you know, like <clears throat> revenge, wanting to seek revenge on those who harmed you in some way or insulted you. That's thinking. So somebody insults me. Last year, somebody might, I remember, this is not, this didn't really happen, but imagine that if I was insulted a year ago, then whenever I think of that person, I want to seek revenge. You know, I, and I noticed this in my early years with Lung Po Cha, I was, was living in the Kuti and getting caught up with, with anger over things that happened 20 years before. And I thought, this anger has nothing to do with the present situation. I wasn't as angry with Ajahn Chah or the monks or the situation at Wapa home, but when you're alone in your kuti, then you, you, you fall back into habits of resentment about how you were treated when you were a child and educational problems and, and social relationships or being brokenhearted or misunderstood. And, and all these kind of memories can, when you're sitting in a nice kuti and the Thai forest, you can bring back all the resentment, all the memories to resent about life not being fair and you're not being misunderstood and not treated properly. And one can get oneself into a real frantic state of wanting to say, you know, I, the, if you can do something, you know, that you can seek revenge physically can't get even with them by slaughtering them or, <clears throat> or making them apologize, you know, <clears throat> this is less violent. <laughs> then all this is thought, isn't it? Imagination. And so once you have that realization, then what's the refuge? Well, just in, in, you know, like I did a lot of meditation on time. And, uh, you know, just the past is a memory, the future is the unknown. And so and then you investigate memories, like being misunderstood or Abused in the past is a memory in the present. And then the tendency, individual tendency to, to uh, feel resentment, carry negative thoughts, wanting to seek revenge, wanting to uh, the person to apologize to me. Uh, wanting, or maybe I'm more idealistic, wanting to forgive and saying life is like this and I should have met up for, for the people who have wronged me in the past, which is a, a beautiful ideal, but, but you don't always feel that way. And where the direct approach is being the witness to the feeling, whatever it is, whether it's a kind, forgiving one or a, a nasty, revengeful one. No anxiety and, you know, worry are just part of life. And when you 
study the history of civilization, you know, it seems like human beings just love wars and taking sides like in the sports are all about taking sides with one team and delighting in their in the opposite loss of a, of a game or feeling resentment, being, blaming the uh, umpire. <laughs> you know, one, how one reacts just in sports because the, there's two teams, one you favor, one you, you don't. And then that's thought, that's about thinking. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan of a certain football team and I want them to win every game and be champions. That's uh, the ego. That's me, Sumato, wanting my side to be the best. And the witness to that is, is, a, is not an ego. The awareness, mindfulness, is not an ego. But thinking is about ego. It's about me and my thoughts and my rights and what is mine and right and wrong and mor morality and immorality and true and false. That goes on, you know, and you, you uh, the, the observer of thought, it's all very divisive. It, it's, but that's its nature. Thinking is, is a critical function. Where Dhamma or conscious awareness isn't critical. So, and that's where we don't suffer, even though we're caught in the midst of maybe a terminal illness or an unfair situation or a war, whatever, you know, the awareness is, is the, the refuge that the Buddha pointed to in his teaching. We're taking sides, winning a war. There's, you know, how many, you know, winning a war and you feel exalted. You know, we 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 right and we we uh, won over the evil forces of the enemy and and all that. See, that's thinking. Like just the word enemy is is a, is a thought that arises in consciousness or friend, my best friend. I have other friends, but this one is my best friend. I mean, that's, that's not, I'm not criticizing it because we all do it, but it's, it's just, you know, if one feels betrayed by one's best friend, that is a lot of suffering. So being betrayed when you think you've been betrayed by your best friend, you know, then you, this is what you feel. You, you're caught in, in anger or resentment. But all these are human emotions that we experience. But are you really a human being? Is that your position in life as a physical form, a man or a woman? You know, the, the bodies are either male or female, and there's kind of issues around transgender and LGBTQ, and that is where we take sides. And we make value judgments, moral judgments, right and wrong, true and false. And that's all thought. That's, But whatever you, how whatever you feel, whether you're transgender or gay or whatever, these are positions you take in life that you you create with thought and uh, identify with with uh, tendencies, karmic tendencies that you inherit. So we inherit, you know, uh, our genes from our parents, our mother and father. We're brought up in a society 
that might be very fair and just and democratic or very dictatorial, very narrow-minded, that affects us, how we were conditioned by our culture, by our social experiences. But witnessing or being aware of that isn't being critical of it, but being, it is thinking, it's illusion, it's memory. So the past is, is a memory, the future is the unknown, now is the knowing. I wrote a, somebody published one of my talks years ago called Now is the Knowing. So just in the news about the, in the United States, the evangelical Christians or the white, is, is America a, a white Christian country? You know, that's, that's debatable. Some people <laughs> Well, I'll try to chase it back and establish it by Christians or by white, old white men. And like <laughs> so these are, you know, these are thoughts that people cling to and fight over. That's what war is about. And so is America, you know, is it, does it belong to white Christians? Or, you know, the white people who came to America and took it over you know, from the Native Americans. That's not right. When you look at early history about how the, the Native Americans were treated, and abused, and that's, that's history now. And then there's movements to try to suppress that kind of knowledge because it's it's embarrassing. We don't want to think of with it. We we try to get rid of the Native American population, but we, because white good white Christians are kind and compassionate. That's a, that's the image we like to we would like to have. But uh, can we really be kind and compassionate? Uh, you know, in the present moment is with what we do when we're mindful of the way it is. Not not saying it shouldn't be, but it's like this: having information, reading a book on the invasion of North America by the Europeans and how that registers in cognitive, you see it personally, then, then you're, you're caught in, uh, in guilt and shame and, and uh, you feel a kind of angry with the government because they won't admit it, they want to, that America is a white man's Christian country is a position that one takes. And so that position is, is justified by deleting them, the embarrassing moments of American, of the invasion of the North American continent. <laughs> we don't want our children to know about that. But uh, when you kind of uh, have knowledge of the rise and fall of civilizations, you know, it's all about migrations. So, like, uh, are immigrants, is that they, they don't have the right to come here because they weren't born here? This is a position one takes. But when you study the history of humanity, it's all about migrations of human groups, tribes, or and it's all about war and abuse that 
that when you're taking over, you know, you're you're moving on to some place that somebody else oh, feels they own, then this is what happened. So is the world something you really want to identify with? Because it's 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 not a beautiful, peaceful perception. But when we when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, to understand suffering, the the being a, a, identifying with your own body is is suffering. Is, is this what I am? This physical body because I can find fault with it. It's not a perfect body. It never was. But it is what, what it is. And then the one suffers if one's not good looking or tall enough or too fat or too thin or black or white or male or female or whatever. You know, these are these are conditions that we either reject or grasp. But wisdom is letting go of these, this, this habit of grasping phenomena, not getting rid of it, but just not holding on or resisting it. So in, in like moral training, you know, when you uh, really observe, you, you can have violent uh, feelings towards somebody, but the moral precepts is that you do not kill, and so you don't. When, when you have no moral precepts, guidelines for action and speech, then anything goes. You feel anger at somebody, you slit their throat, or and you, you know, that's what being a psychopath as well. But when you've got some kind of moral position, like in Buddhism, the five precepts, then that, that helps the guide towards, because we can't help sometimes wanting to slit somebody's throat, but we don't do it. Or telling a lie, or stealing something, you know, or sexually abusing somebody else, you know, it isn't that none of us ever have these thoughts or feelings, but we don't act on them because the the respect for the five precepts, or in the bhikkhu life, the two hundred twenty-seven precepts. So like we can't eat food in the afternoon after 12, but that doesn't mean we don't want to. It means that we, we observe the precept, but we're aware of our own habit of wanting three meals a day or whatever your conditioning is. Thank you for these reflections, Uncle.